Right. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to go to your word again. We thank you for the word of God, and we thank you for what it's done for us, how it brought us to salvation by the Holy Spirit of God, and how we were born again by the word of God, uh, not a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever. And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that it brought us to a surrender of our lives to serve you. And that it spoke to us to uh, present our bodies a living sacrifice and renew our minds and give our gifts to you. Thank you for the blessed word of God. And we thank you today for the fact that it comforts our hearts and it guides us. And uh, it's the light under our paths and a lamp under our feet. And we thank you for that. And today, I thank you for these men and women that are trying to learn more of your word so that they can bless others and equip them with the word of God. And so, Lord, I pray you take this time and make it count for eternity that it might be word of God and thoughts that would be sown into their hearts and minds that they will sow into other people's hearts and minds. Thank you for the measure of physical strength you've given us. And even for this ability through Zoom to communicate at such a great distance. And most of all, we wanna thank you today that you planned our salvation, Father. And you provided your son for us and he provided the acceptable sacrifice for us so that we could have a relationship with you. And today we do not rejoice that the demons um, would even be subject to us as the disciples came back rejoicing. But we rejoice that our names are written in heaven. And we rejoice today that you have revealed these truths of your salvation and who you are as a father to us, not to mighty peoples, necessarily kings or political leaders, but God to us that are really nobodies in this world, but you have revealed yourself to us. And we get to live in such a time when we live in a crisis hour to minister to the word of God. I pray that the word that has been sown into people's lives this past week through the witness of these men and women and our witness, God, that it would bring forth much fruit, that it would bring souls to you. And we thank you now that we can be like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, learning of him. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And thank you that you're going to meet every one of our needs spiritually, physically, mentally, and socially. In his lovely name we pray. And women. And uh, I just want to reiterate about the last section of our class that we're giving you. We've already covered two thirds of the class. And so we have uh, three more lectures and then a final exam that will take probably an hour and a half or so because it'll be worth uh, 80 points. And uh, there will be questions on it as to whether you have read the textbook assignments for this class and the reading of the scripture. So I wanna go back and just reemphasize that Genesis one through three, Leviticus, one through seven, you know, those Psalms, Psalms 30, 22, Isaiah 53, Romans 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1 through 6, Colossians 1 through 2, Philippians 2, 1 through 13, which we're going to go to today, Lord willing, and Revelation chapters 1 through 3 and 19 through 22. And then Thesis book, there's these pages, 274 to 397, just about 125 pages. And you need to have that read. You don't have to have a hard copy of it. You can go online once again and download it, PDF format. But we would expect you to 
have read those things. And if you don't, there will be points subtracted because of the extra 20 points that I'm going to give you besides 60 questions. Uh, there will be credit given, as we state in our assignment sheet, for the reading of the materials. So keep that in mind. You need to, if you haven't been keeping up with the reading, you need to really go at the reading of this at this time. But we uh, trust that you all got the uh, information that we sent over to you in our next section of lecture notes, fall of man and the necessity of a savior. And I intentionally started in this course in the matter of defining terms. Uh, because I think that's the most critical part of the course is to get the definition of words. And there will be a section in this uh, next stretch that I'm going to give you definitions of words. But uh, I would like to just say uh, we need to turn to Thiessen's book, page 275 to 277. Because we're going to cover three things, man's fall, man's sinfulness, and man's need of a savior. And we'll cover those three sections in the remainder of our lectures. But Dr. Thiessen on page 275 starts up with once again the fact, the purpose of God. God the Father had it planned knowing that man would fall he before the foundation of the earth before the creation of the world he already had it figured out as man fell it didn't surprise him he already had a plan and we're going to see that but the man's big problem is through the fall that he has a problem understanding how sinful he is and he has an overestimation of how good he is our sin nature has that we've inherited is a proud nature and it gives us the benefit of the doubt and no one else the benefit of the doubt. But Dr. Thiessen starts up and he says about human nature on 275, he says the fall of man occasioned the loss of his original innocence and holiness, but it did not rob him of all of his spiritual knowledge. Now, he doesn't have an accurate knowledge of God. He has a partial knowledge of God, and it's not always accurate. But he talks about the knowledge of God. He says the intuitive knowledge of the existence of some God or gods is generally acknowledged. Whether you go into the dark, deep jungles of Africa, or you go over to Papua New Guinea, or you go into the Philippines, you're go, uh, you go any place, and people are going to believe in a higher being or a higher creator. And Romans chapter one is very clear that the invisible things are actually seen by those things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead, as it says in Romans 1.20. So we want to keep that in mind as introductory paragraph, because I'm reading in my lecture notes now and saying that in his lectures in systematic the theology, he declares man's nature limits his ability to know sinfulness and to know God. Now, now creation will show us that there is, has to be an intelligent being and a powerful being to make everything that we see. And so there only sensible logic tells us, but Creation declares the glory of God, his great power and his great intellect, but it does not enable man to have a personal relationship with God the Father and with God the Son or with God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. But there is still within a man a knowledge that there must be a God and a consciousness of sin within man. He still has a conscience, though it's skewed. Uh, there also is the need of a sacrifice. And you see that. If you stop and think of Northeast India, when William Pettigrew went up into Northeast India in the 1890s, he went amongst headhunters. But what were those headhunters doing? Yes, they were 
lopping other people's heads off, killing one another in those tribal wars, village attacks. And what, but what was it? They were still sacrificing. They were sacrificing to the god of the river, the god of the trees or forest, the god of uh, rain, you, you name it. Different gods. And they were sacrificing, trying to appease the displeasure of these so-called gods. Now, we know that those were demonic beings that were getting them to worship themselves, the demons, through uh, natural objects. We know what that's all about, but they still recognized there needed to be sacrifice. Uh, cutting a chicken's head off and sprinkling the blood out before the god of the river to appease the wrath of the river. And I understand how that can happen even right now in, uh, in this great flooding in our country down in Florida through Hurricane Ian. Uh, there's been great flooding, you know, some places getting, getting 50 to 15 to 20 inches of rain in 24 hours and flooding happening. And some could say, well, that's a God that's angry with us, the God of the river or the God of rain or the God of the skies. And there would be an attempt by the animus that William Pettigrew went to minister to that they needed to sacrifice to appease those gods. But the only way man can know God in an intimate, personal way in salvation is revealed only by the Old and New Testament scriptures. You can know God through, there is a God by conscience of your sin and that there must be a holy being. There's lots of ways in Romans chapter two, verses one through 16 talks about different ways that you can, you're gonna be judged by and that you could know there is a God, but the only way ultimately to know God intimately and personally is see what the scripture says about God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Adam's disobedience to God resulted in the human race with an imputed sin penalty. Now, let me just reemphasize what we concluded with last time that when we talk about types and anti-types, the first Adam is the type of the anti-type Jesus Christ, the second Adam. And scripture calls Jesus Christ the second Adam and emphasizes this in Romans 5, that for by one man's sin, many were made disobedient. Yes, by one man's disobedience, many were condemned in sin. So Adam was the representative of the whole human race. If he overcame the temptation and won the victory, then the whole human race would be permanently perpetuated in innocence. That is, the whole human race would be considered perfect, sinless, and holy in a permanent positive way forever. But he didn't do that. So the result was he, as the first representative of the human race, cast the whole human race into sin and the penalty or consequence of sin. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, that's Jesus Christ, as Romans 5 says, shall many be made righteous. So we find that Jesus now made it possible for that penalty of sin to be removed and man now to be right before God or righteous meet the righteous standard. But not only was there a penalty of sin, but there was an imparting of a sin nature. Now, you look at theological uh, places, and we're going to read this a little later, but there's usually three different positions of how human beings get a sin nature. Now, over in the Hindu area of the world, you, you, they're going to say, well, the soul transmigrates. And so uh, the body dies, but the soul is eternal and it will go to the next uh, person uh, or the next uh, 
animal that it's re reincarnated in. And so it goes ahead and takes on the sin nature because from generation to generation. But the real issue is where does a soul get its sin nature? And some would say, well, whenever a person is conceived in a mother's womb or is born that God gives man a soul and what corrupts a soul is the actual sinful body and that is a position that i don't take it's a creationist position of the soul by god because it implicates god in setting up sin uh, and it, it talks about the power of a sinful body to transfer and defile it's sinful corruption upon a soul. The traditionary position is really that at conception, not only is there the genetics that are imperfect of the physical being, there's also the imperfection of the soul started by the conception of a male sperm to a zygote or an egg of a woman in her being. And so therefore at conception, we receive a body that will be imperfect in its genetic makeup and a soul that is imperfect because of its sinful contamination or the sin nature. So there's an imparted sin nature that's passed on from generation to generation. The reason I believe this is scripturally is Psalm 51.5. Behold, I was in sin did my mother conceive me, he says, is actually what Psalm 51, five says. Well, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me, is what David said. And I, I think we're talking about a conception, getting a sin nature in Psalm 51, five. You can write that down there. In fact, that'd be a good quiz or test question, don't you think? I'm gonna write it down right now and say, hey, I'm gonna give you a question on that, but God already had a plan. And that is why God's plan was given to Adam and Eve in the protoangelium. And when we talk about the protoangelium, we are talking about Genesis 3.15. Now I wanna clarify what this word is. It's not easy to pronounce and most of us can't define it. But you would take that word and put it somewhere where to the left of it in the margin, Protovangelium means good news, first good news. The prota is where we get the word proton or protos, the Greek word, and it means first. And that last part of it talks about an evangelist or evangel or euangelizomai, or euangelia, which means a good message, literally, or good news. And so it's the first good news. After man fell, God pronounced the good news that he had a plan. And that's what Genesis 3.15 is. If you, if you would turn with me to Genesis 3.15, you're familiar with it, but this is another one that you need to remember. Uh, what it really is saying and how it's connected to this word that has been given to it, have a compound Greek word meaning good news. We call the good news in the New Testament, the gospel. But it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Now God is talking to the serpent, which is Satan, in a physical form, it shall bruise thy head, the seed of the woman. And seed is singular. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head or thy head. And that's singular. Thy is a singular pronoun, possessive pronoun. And thou shalt bruise his heel. So Satan, you'll bruise his heel at Calvary's cross through death, it was a bruising of the heel of Jesus, but not a termination of him, the seed of the woman. Now, 
uh, oftentimes theologians go to Genesis 4 and she bears a son named Cain. Behold, I've gotten a man. And it's thought by theologians that Eve thought she had just born the Messiah that was going to destroy or crush the serpent's head. Now, we know that wasn't Cain. We know that he was a follower of Satan and murdered his own brother Abel. But she thought this is the fulfillment of this good news promise of Genesis 3.15. Well, a mediator between God and man would be necessary to enable sinful man to have a relationship with God. And so there's a barrier now. And keep this in mind, when Adam and Eve sinned, immediately they tried to cover themselves. And what were they doing when they tried to cover themselves? They were saying, our bodies, we sense we're guilty. Let's cover them. So clothing is not only to protect us from the sun or from the rain or the cold or the heat, clothing, the original man and woman that put clothing on did that because they sensed they were guilty. And whenever God's voice was heard to come in fellowship with him in the cool of the day, they were covering themselves with fig leaves and hiding in the bushes. Why? Because they died the day that they disobeyed God. They didn't die physically. They died spiritually. And that means to be separated. Remember that uh, death in the Bible is separation. One word defines it. And so separation from God because of the sin. The sin became the divider between them and God, a barrier. And they were fearful. The first mention of fear came out of guilt. And so God came and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? Oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I was afraid. Why were you afraid? Did you eat of the fruit of the tree? Now, God already knew the answer to that question, but he wanted Adam and Eve to recognize that it's because of what they had done in disobeying him and being disloyal in a distrust and lack of love that now they were separated from him by sin. So someone had to come and break that barrier down. How's that barrier going to be removed between God and man? The sin of guilt and the sin nature. How's that going to be remedied? Well, we see the seed of the woman, a human being, will crush the serpent's head. But that would mean the death of a human mediator stated as bruising his heel. 1 Timothy 2 in the New Testament, in verse 5, really just nails this down as the fulfillment in Christ. And it says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for many. So keep that in mind. This asserts that Jesus, the son of David, a human being, son of Adam, a human being, yes, the seed of the woman paid the payment of infinite death. You remember when Jesus was on the cross and we have you reading Psalm 22 and that Psalm starts out with this statement. Psalm 22 verse one says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so separation from God, the father by God, the son had never been experienced before, but now Jesus is experiencing separation from the father why because he's paying for our penalty of sin which deserves eternal infinite separation from god forever and he was as infinite son of god taking an infinite payment upon him of separation from the infinite god the father and so this payment of an infinite death for mankind would make man accepted in God's presence if they would receive the payment. And just because Jesus did it doesn't mean that everybody has it. You have to receive and come back to God and say, I trust you, God, I love you, and I depend upon you, and I'm going to accept your son as the only way. 
For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now, man has fallen, and after the fall and through the centuries, God demonstrated or will demonstrate to man his sinful and fallen condition in seven periods of testing. We're talking about man as a human race as a whole, mankind. And so God puts humans to the test through the centuries. These test periods are sometimes called dispensations. Now, I don't know if you've done much study in eschatology in your theological studies, but eschatology talks about the difference of covenant theologians and dispensational theologians. Yes, and the difference between reformed theologians and and non-reformed theologians, but dispensationalists are people that have this that I'm giving you right now. In fact, uh, Thiessen would have been uh, what we would call a historical dispensationalist from the last century. And dispensationalism talks about different time periods in which God tested man very clearly and each of them being seven total. We're in, according to Thesen, in the sixth one, and there's still a seventh one to come. We're in the church age. That's the sixth one. The seventh one is the millennial reign of Christ here on planet Earth. And so Thesen labels them in the following way. And if you would turn to his book, that would be good because we're going to go over and look at some of these that he's talked about the fact that there's a knowledge of God and a knowledge of sin and a need of sacrifice. This is seen in the scriptures. And then he talks about the plan of God. And on page 277, he says, the plan of God, he who works in an orderly way in nature has left not the salvation of man to a haphazard and uncertain experimentation. Scripture shows us that he had a definite plan and has a definite plan of salvation. This plan includes the means by which salvation is to be provided, the objectives that are to be realized in that plan of salvation, and the persons that are going to benefit by this plan of salvation, and the conditions on which it is available it's available or accessible to man and the agents and means by which it is to be applied. So we know that the plan includes the means Jesus Christ is a sacrifice. And we also know that the objectives that are to be realized is that we do one day to be uh, adopted, glorified, holy and without blame before him in love as Ephesians 1 says. The persons that are to benefit by him are those that are elect. Those that will receive Christ will be the ones that benefit. The conditions on which it's to be available is through the scripture by faith and the agents and means by which it is to be applied. The Holy Scripture by the Holy Spirit is going to come and apply that. But he goes on to say it may be added that he has only one plan. And keep this in mind. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So there's one plan, not many of them. There's only one way to heaven. It's exclusive. And don't apologize for that ever. You know, my wife and I are going to go to an American football game possibly tomorrow. Now, we do this about once every five to 10 years. She got a free ticket for us to go and to watch a university that's close to us, Clemson University. And we could go to that uh, place and we're going to be way up high in the top of the stadium because we got the cheapest tickets given to us there are. And if we go, though, to enter in that stadium, there will be a gate with people standing at the gate, and they'll be saying, 
hand me your ticket, show me that you have paid to get in. And if I go up to that gate tomorrow and I uh, say, listen, uh, good to see you guys today. And we're here to watch the game. And they say, good to see you. Now, where's your ticket? And I say, I don't have a ticket. You say, you don't have a ticket. What do you, why do you think you're going to get in? Well, hey, I've been a good person. I'm a pastor. I treat people kindly. They say, now, listen, we're not concerned about your uh, recommendations of yourself. Where's your ticket? And I say, but you don't understand. I've been good to my neighbors. I'm going to go help my neighbor with a problem that, that he has. He talked to me about it yesterday. No, come on now, listen. I just want to know where's your ticket, he says. I said, but I give some of the vegetables I grow in my garden to my neighbors. I'm a good man. Don't you catch that? He said, now, come on. I said, well, I'm a good husband. Well, is that good enough? And he said, listen, if you don't give me your ticket, you're hindering other people getting in. I'm going to have the security policeman come here and throw you out of this place if you don't give me your ticket or get out of the way and leave. Now, folks, that's exactly what it is. Our ticket is Jesus Christ. He's the only way that we will ever get into heaven. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. And in that context, Jesus has just told his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. John 14 and verse 1. You believe in God, the Father. You believe in me. And in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And one of his disciples said, uh, we don't know where you're going, Lord. And he comes and he says, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. That's why he responded that way. Okay, so we want to go on and just say that there's only one way. It doesn't matter whether it's the uncivilized or the civilized, moral or immoral, whether living in the Old Testament dispensation or now, there's only one way. And that's by faith in God and his promise. Now, the revelation of God's plan, there's an outline of his plan and the methods in which he does that. But we have in page 279, the different eras or what we would say periods of time or dispensations. And we're going to look at that right now. First of all, the Edic, the Eden period. This is the Garden of Eden. And so it's, it says in our notes, and this is what even uh, Dr. Thiessen talks about, it's tested in a perfect environment by one restriction, tested for loyal love that trusted God and would obey him. So that's really what God was doing. In other words, uh, he didn't want us to just be programmed like a computer or a robot to automatically do everything he says. He wanted us to choose to have a loving relationship with him. And so that's why he gave him. Uh, so he didn't want it to be just an automatic thing, like an automotive car, you turn the key in and hopefully it starts. Uh, just by turning a key. No, he didn't want that. He wanted a loving response by someone that has a mind, a will, and emotions. And they would choose to be affectionately related to him and would follow his direction. Fail. Genesis 2 and 3 is all about that failure. And so that's the first period. The second period is the antediluvian. And that literally means anti, means pre, and diluvian means flood. So the pre-flood time is found in Genesis 4 through 6. Write that down next to the side of point number two. That happened in the pre-flood time. And what happened? Well, Cain killed his brother, wouldn't accept the correction as fair. And you find braggarts. Uh, coming along and killing people and then saying if God protected the, uh, Cain 
so he'll protect me seven times more. And you get all kinds of sin going on. Man uh, says that Adam had children in his own image, and that own image is not just divine godly image, but a marred image and a sin nature image was handed in Genesis 5 and verse 1. Come to Genesis 6, and what is it? Genesis 6 talks about man and those that were the godly human beings married the ungodly human beings. And what was the result? These were people of great achievement. They were men of renown. They were what we call the successful of the earth. But the whole earth, it says, was full of violence. Now, I oftentimes ask people, why did God destroy the earth with a flood? And they'll say, well, every thought of his imagination was only evil continually. The Bible says that. But the thing that God emphasizes three times in that chapter is the violence, the radical attack upon personages and others, maybe animals, that is just vicious and violent. And the whole earth was full of violence, controlled by violence is what that full means. Everybody was in it, yes, but controlled by violent anger, willing to kill one another, as we say, at the drop of a hat. Okay, so man has failed. His conscience didn't stop him from sinning. God said, conscience will be the test. And man defiled his conscience, seared it, and his sin nature just took over. And it was a destructive society, a violent, a murder-loving, violent society. And so man failed. And then God, after the flood of cleansing all of the earth of corrupt man that was violent, says, we're going to have a fresh start. So we're going to have a human government. And in Genesis 9 and verse 6, it talks about not shedding man's blood. Once again, back to that violence. We're going to correct this by human government. And if someone sheds someone else's blood, we're going to have their blood shed, is what God said. Capital punishment, as we call it. And that ought to restrain sin. But no, it didn't fail. Think about mankind after that. Uh, though they had a promise by the rainbow that there would never be a flood uh, over all the earth. So there's this asterisk floods happening in many countries of the world right now. Our country down in Florida is having it. Well, what is it? It is the fact that God isn't going to destroy the earth by a flood. But man, in having government turn that unified government and under leaders, decided to build a tower to the glory of man and elevate man up to heaven, build it all the way up to heaven, and so to speak, become equal with God, living independently of God. God had to come and take the Tower of Babel, or Babel, as some have called it, and destroy that unity that they had in pride under human government. You know, human government isn't the answer to solve our problems in this world. And the only way that's going to be solved is when Jesus, a perfect leader, comes and reigns and enforces the law upon sinful men with a rod of iron. So man failed. So human government didn't solve the issue of man's sinfulness article period is number four and god promised to abraham your seed i'm going to bless and your seed is going to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth now you all i'm asking you to do is go to the be in the promised land and i will bless you and things will go well but did they stay in the promised land no and once again they left the promised land so the covenant that God had, with we call the patriarchal covenant, did not carry through. Man failed when it came to promised blessing 
in a covenant relationship with God. And so man's failure to keep that covenant means now we move to another one. And that's the Mosaic law was another dispensation. Now, Genesis 12 through Exodus 2 is when the patri uh, patriarchal promises happen. But now the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law starts, of course, with Moses. And it's an agreement. And it was an agreement that was agreed upon by the people. You remember they got into Israel, Mount Gerizim up there. And they said, yes, we will keep all the commandments of God for blessing. And they promised publicly as a nation they would keep the Mosaic law. Now, we know there are 613 laws in the Mosaic law. That's a pile of commandments to remember, let alone obey them all. Ten commandments, you say, I could handle remembering them. And uh, most of the time I can remember them, but I certainly haven't kept them all. They agreed, but they did not obey all of them, and they failed. So now we're in the church age. Christ has died, and it's the age of grace, a period of saved by grace. And the, the test is not will you keep commandments perfectly? Will you simply submit to my way? Second Thessalonians is a great passage. People ask me, he says, is Jesus really going to come back one day? Is he going to come back to punish people? Is he going to come back with a trumpet blowing and the voice of the archangel? Well, in 2 Thessalonians 1, to persecuted believers, and by the way, you know persecuted people, give them 2 Thessalonians 1. In your country, there are places, there are people are experiencing persecution, then show them 2 Thessalonians 1. You that are persecuted unfairly and unjustly, one day justice will come. And it says in that passage in verse 7, and the Lord Jesus shall come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Obey not the good news that Jesus Christ is the promised one. The way. And so they wouldn't submit to it. And you know, you find that today. People are so proud. I talk to people often over here. In fact, they took a survey in a state I was in last month. In August, my wife and I went up into Ohio to have part of a wedding of one of our missionary children that his parents were in a communist Asian country. They couldn't even come to the wedding because they thought we'll never get back in if we leave. So we had their youngest son's wedding. And the whole issue was that he wanted me to preach the gospel for about 15, 20 minutes. And so I just gave the gospel in that wedding and gave an invitation to respond to the gospel for people to be saved that were listening live stream all over the world. But up there in Ohio, some years ago, they took a survey of one town and they went through and ask every house, how do you get to heaven? How will you ultimately get into heaven? And you know what was said? 20% of them gave the right answer. Only through Jesus Christ as Savior will you get into heaven. The other 80% all said, well, be a good person. Keep the Ten Commandments. Be good to your neighbor. You know, and that's how I'm planning on getting to heaven is I'm going to uh, pay my tithe and I'm going to be, join a church and I'm going to be baptized and I'm going to take the Lord's Supper and on and on. And all of it had to do with man's works, man's pride of doing good enough so God would have to accept him. Listen, all of our righteousness is as a filthy rags, it says in Isaiah 64 and verse 5. The best we can do is nothing like greasy, stained, dirty rags. 
And so we best not try and depend upon our righteousness because in the sight of a holy, perfect God. And so they gave 80%. So man's pride. Once again, the majority of the people in the world will not be saved by grace. And we're in the period of grace. Man fails again because of his sinful nature that is proud and arrogant. Well, in the future, there is going to be another period. And the future is the messianic reign. Jesus Christ will come back after the seven years of tribulation and set up a government in Jerusalem, in Zion, and become the king of kings of the earth and lord of lords. A fulfillment of Psalm 2 and verse 8. And I like this psalm because, you know, this psalm is a psalm that Jim Starr oftentimes promotes as to how God called him to do outreach to India. But what I like about it, the psalm is really not a promise to Jim Starr. It's a promise from God the Father to God the Son. And he says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. These kings of the earth and nations that have uh, mocked us and says, we'll not have this man or these kings to reign over us, this God and his son to reign over us. God laughs and he says, one day I'm just telling my son, you ask of me and I'll give you all the nations. That's going to happen at the millennial reign of Christ, at the second coming of Christ. And so we see the Messiah will reign with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And you want to put down Revelation 20 next to that. Yes, the church age is Matthew 1 through Revelation 3. That's clearly the church age described. But now Revelation 19 and 20 goes right into the millennial reign of Christ. And there will be a perfect government and a perfect governor, Jesus Christ. And he will enforce the laws. And there are people going into the millennium will all be with a new nature. But there will be children born with a sin nature. And those that are born through that thousand years, when at the end of the thousand years, Satan, who's been confined into the pit, the abyss, will be released for a temporary time, and many people will automatically follow him in a rebellion. A war against Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and one word fails him. The sword out of Jesus' mouth, his spoken words, destroys that army, and and wins the victory instantaneously, and Satan is put into the lake of fire forever. But a group of unregenerated sinful men will always fail to relate to God in a loving obedience. We must have a regenerated nature and a mediator to stay rightly related to God. If you don't believe a man's sinfulness, or you're not convinced how sinful man is. It would be good before we go into this next section for you to read Romans 3. Verses 10 through 19. And there's quite a photograph in there, so to speak. God takes out his wallet, as we call it, or billfold, his money holder or credit card holder. And he has a picture in there. And I carry a I've historically carried a picture of my family and my billfold. Now I carry it in my phone. I carry one of my whole family of children and grandchildren <clears throat> and their mom and dads and my wife and I. In my Bible, I have a hard copy picture. And uh, I probably ought to show you sometime what that picture looks like, but God pulls out his billfold and writes it down in Romans 3, what mankind looks like to him. There is none righteous. There's none that understands. They're all gone out of the way. There's none good, no, not one. And then he says, the poison of asp is underneath their lips. They're whited sepulcher. You know, the whole picture is just terrible. And that's a picture of the human race in the eyes of God. His photographic eyes take a picture 
And that's what man looks like. And that's what we're going to talk about in the second session today that we cover about man's sinfulness is being proven by history when history demonstrates that man fails God's test as a whole. The many terms that God gives in the Bible to define or describe sin are listed by Charles Ryrie in his book, Basic Theology. If you have access to his book, I'd ask you to pull it up in our break time. Because we're going to look at page 209 through 212 of Ryrie's points on th that there are eight Hebrew words needed to describe man's sinfulness or sinning and 12 Greek New Testament words to cover all the aspects of man's sin. It takes only three words in the Bible, two in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament to describe grace or to show what grace is. Chin, kesed, karis. Chin and kesed are Hebrew words Karis is the Greek word for grace. And we're going to look at those terms and some illustrations of them. So we just, once again, the necessity of a savior is what we're looking at. And I would like to close out this session by just saying this. Why spend this much time? This depresses me about man's fall, man's sinfulness. People never get prompted in their heart to want to have a savior and come to the savior until they realize their lost condition. We have a saying here, you don't get a person saved until you get them lost. You don't get a person wanting salvation until you see that they don't want hell and God's judgment. And that's exactly what happened to me. I will never get over it. January, I'm sorry, February 22, the 22nd of Je uh, February, 1959. That bald-headed preacher, probably in his late 60s, Pastor Chaffin, got up and preached, we're all sinners and all of us deserve the wages of sin, which is death, which is hell, and a place of burning separated from God. And boy, when God's spirit made that real to me, see, God's spirit starts out, you're facing judgment and you're in danger. And you better take God's way out of that danger. You better take the warning. So we got to get people. And so in our preaching, we need to preach the utter sinfulness of mankind and then when people say, I'm in a desperate condition, then give them the good news of God sending the Savior. And that's exactly what Pastor Chapman did for me. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that this morning. I say, God, thank you. That, that age, 10 and a half years of old, you showed me and you put my name in your book. I'm rejoicing this morning, not that demons are subject to me like the disciples in Luke 10. But I'm rejoicing that my name's written in heaven. God, I'm rejoicing that you showed me that you're a father, a loving father that sent your son to die in my place. Yes, just like Jesus said, I thank you, Father, that you've revealed yourself to babes, not kings and prophets or whoever, but to kings, no, to children, to humble people you showed yourself to them. And Luke 10 is a good reminder. I just read that in my devotions. And there were four things I was thanking God for this morning. And I hope he's going to just say, I pray that you'll be thankful. But we're going to have a break time. It's uh, Let's have about uh, five to seven minutes and we'll be back and finish our session here today on fall of man and necessity of a savior. Oh. Pastor, 